What happens after the orchid seeds germinate? Well, today we're going to find out. Hi, I'm Jess, and today we're going to be talking about orchid seeds and what happens after they germinate. Orchid seeds are quite different from most ornamental plants that you may come across. They don't have an endosperm, and if you look very carefully under the microscope, the seed basically looks like an embryo with kind of a mesh cage wrapped around it. It doesn't have a nutrient pack, so it relies on mycorrhizal fungi for it to develop and form. In our normal environment, it's quite hard to harvest the mycorrhizal fungi to help the orchids grow and germinate. So in its place, we've created a nutrient soup in a agar jello type solution. So that kind of media is the perfect place to help the orchid seeds germinate. In a previous video, I showed how we sow orchid seeds onto this agar media. And now this is the next step. So what happens afterwards? After sowing the seeds, you want to determine if these seeds have germinated. And usually there will be swelling of the orchid seed coat and then um, it'll slowly break from freedom of the coat and then there will be some protocorns. Now there is a difference between terrestrial orchids and epiphytic orchids in how you want to grow these plants, but the overall development is still the same. There will be a protocorn mass and from this structure is where the leaves and roots will eventually emerge. So that's what happens when the orchid seed germinate. And for a hobbyist really getting into the process, right when you see those protocorns develop that nice green look, it kind of looks like green caviar tiny little green dots spread about all the media. And depending how thick or how thin you've sown um, the seeds is how that whole thing will develop. Now, depending upon several factors, you may have to start transferring these tiny little protocorns or seedlings um, from the initial mother flask into uh, daughter flasks. Basically, that means you just wanna give these plants more space, more nutrients for it to grow and develop. The typical timeline to transfer these seedlings is about every six to 12 months. Now this is just a general guideline and we don't always have to follow it depending on our own situations. There are a few things that call for this kind of transferring of seedlings or replates. So one is if you see an overcrowding of the protocorns or seedlings, you wanna thin them out to give them the best opportunity to grow because when it gets too competitive in there, you may get some die off. The second is if it's been in the media for over six months, even more than over a year, the nutrients in the media may have already been used up and it may also cause the plants to not do well and so you would notice a slower growth rate for these plants and that would also be a time to move it into a more nutrient rich media and the third thing to look for is for any possible contaminations or any other um, things that may hinder the plants growth usually that would be some sort of bacterial or fungal contaminations another thing may be that as the plant grows and matures it's giving off these compounds called phenols it uses up all the air and carbon dioxide and it basically basically suffocates itself to death. That's not what we want. So that's where replates or transferring of seedlings comes into play. For my situation, I noticed that some of the protocorns were climbing up the wall. So ideally you want it to be in contact with the nutrient solution so that it can have its best chance to grow. This gave me an opportunity to try out these replates and transferring of seedlings to see how I would do in this step. When it comes to replates, it's a fairly straightforward process, but I think the technique and the timing is what really makes it, is really what determines your success. For replates, you really need a couple of things. A clean workspace, um, your mother flask, your daughter flasks with more nutrient dense media, and a couple of tools like some tweezers or scoop, um, and also just to have rubbing alcohol on hand. Basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna open the top of the mother flask and either use tweezers or a scoop to take out all of those um, seedlings to thin it out or what have you and put it in a new jar. The process isn't that difficult but time is of the essence so that you don't get contaminations. Um, I try to work as fast as possible. And in this case, I put um, all these seedlings into about four daughter flasks. Uh, since this is my first time doing replates, I wanna reduce the contamination as much as possible. So for two of the jars, I added about half a mil of hydrogen peroxide into both of these flasks. And for the other two, I used it as a control to see if they would do okay without adding hydrogen peroxide. After that, you just set it aside and you just watch these plants. After a week, everything looked great. 
but between day seven to day 10 is when I noticed some contamination in two of the flasks that I didn't add hydrogen peroxide. In both of those jars, they developed a little bit of mold and I didn't scoop it out quickly enough. So I had to uh, remove those jars. The other two jars that had hydrogen peroxide in it, um, they didn't get any contaminations. However, there was a side effect. The hydrogen peroxide not only killed the fungal spores and the bacteria that could possibly contaminate the media, but it also caused some of the protocorns to die. So I got about maybe 30% of the protocorns that were in the reflasked media, um, they died. And unfortunately, that's a bad side effect to that. And maybe perhaps I could either tone down the amount of hydrogen peroxide in use, or I could put it under UV lights or in the sun to kind of degrade the hydrogen peroxide faster so that I would get less protocorn death. This was kind of a compromise for me. I know if you do great technique and you have a very sterile place, then you probably can get away without adding hydrogen peroxide. So for me, this was just kind of a test to see what would happen. One is I got full contaminations in both jars and the other one, no contaminations, but some of the protocorns died. And I'm actually okay with that because I'm not trying to grow thousands and thousands of seedlings. I'm just doing this as an experiment to see if I can even grow and do this process. So even if I have only one seedling left in these jars, I'm perfectly fine with that because at least I know that I'm able to grow it and I can refine my technique over time. So when it comes to contaminations, there's a couple of things that you can do. Now, if it's a bacterial contamination, that usually looks kind of like a slimy film over the entire surface of the media. Sometimes it's in a small patch, sometimes it takes over everything. And in that case, uh, the jar is pretty much done. There's no real way to add antibiotics into an entire flask. So in that case, it's just better to start over again. When it comes to fungal contaminations, if you catch it early enough, you might be okay. For a fungal contamination, you'll notice them because there'll be these white little fuzzy dots. And if you catch it early enough, you can scoop out those little fuzzy dots, add a little bit of hydrogen peroxide into the well of the um, scooped media, and that should be able to contain the fungal spore contamination. If you don't catch it in time, it will spread throughout the entire media and then your jar will be lost. So those are the contaminations that I've noticed so far and that I've dealt with personally. I haven't really been successful in saving contaminated flasks, but for now, since I'm not dealing with any high value plants, um, mostly no IDs at this point, um, I'm okay letting a couple of these flasks go and focusing on the ones that are more successful. After transferring these seeds into the daughter flasks, you just let it wait and grow and sit. If it outgrows the jar, then I can transfer it to another one. Otherwise, it can probably stay there for at least another year or so, depending on the rate of growth. Now, of course, every species or hybrid that you make will react differently and grow at different rates. So this is the process between germination and growing it out into a full seedling. This process is very intensive and it can be anywhere from one to two years or even longer, depending on the growth rate of these plants, where these orchids will stay in these enclosed glass jars. I'm still in the process of learning how to grow orchids from seed and I'm just sharing with you my process. So this is not going to be a foolproof solution that will work for everyone every time in every environment. This is just something that as one hobbyist to another, I can share with you my thoughts. And if you want to see more videos like this, please click on the playlist about growing orchids from seed. And I'll see you in the next episode. Bye.